Hello and welcome to Lace Is Home. My dad listens to this. I'm Juliet, the daughter. And I'm Kevin, the currently coughing and sniffling dad. Dad has a cold. Deal with it. And as we record today, our final episode of 2022, you know what that means? It's our Christmas special. So we are covering the music of a Charlie Brown Christmas. So dad, what do we need to know? We need to know that Vincent Anthony Delaglio was born in the North Beach area of San Francisco on July 17th, 1928. When his mother married a second time, Vince's stepdad, Tony Garaldi, adopted him, hence the name change. Vince was influenced by two of his uncles who led jazz bands in San Francisco. He graduated high school and served in the Army in Korea as a cook from 1946 to 1948. Like George Costanza's dad. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Anyway, go on. When he came back, he briefly attended San Francisco State College. He developed a passion for the piano, first boogie-woogie, then blues, and then jazz. He would sit in with local acts, and he got his big break playing during intermission for Art Tatum at the Black Hawk nightclub. In 1951, Vince joined vibraphonist Cal Jada's trio. In 1955, he formed his own quartet, appearing on an album called Modern Music from San Francisco, which also featured other local acts. Fantasy Records released it and signed Vince to an exclusive contract in 1956. His debut, Vince Garaldi Trio, came out in September the same year. A follow-up, a Flower is a Lonesome Thing came out in 1957. It did not do well, and Fantasy released Vince. In 1962, Vince recorded Jazz Impressions of Black Orpheus, mm. inspired by the film of the same name. It was mostly covers of Antonio Carlos Jobim songs, but he needed something to fill out the album, so he wrote an original number. Fantasy t actually took a shot on the album to cash in on the bossa nova craze. <laughs> They sent out a single to radio stations, Samba de Orpheus, but DJs played the B-side instead, which was Vince's original number. Mm -hmm. Cast Your Fate to the Wind spent 19 weeks in the top 100, going all the way to number 22. No small feat for his jazz instrumental. Vince would go on to win a Grammy for Best Original Jazz Composition. Mm. He never got tired of playing the song over the years. He said it was like signing the back of a check. <laughs> Vince put out more albums and also composed a jazz mass for San Francisco's Grace Cathedral. In 1964, TV producers Bill Melendez and Lee Mendelson were working on a documentary about Peanuts cartoonist Charles Schultz. Mendelssohn heard Cast Your Fate to the Wind and thought Vince would be perfect to compose music for the documentary. He got in contact with Garaldi, who accepted. The soundtrack, Jazz Impressions of Charlie Brown, was released in October 1964. Oh, was this it marked the first appearance of the song Linus and Lucy. However, the documentary itself was shelved because Mendelssohn could not secure a sponsorship. Uh. But Charles Schultz and Lee Mendelssohn retained Vince for their next project, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Mm -hmm. Brought to you by the people in your town who bottle mm. Coca-Cola. Rounding out the trio for that album was bassist Fred Marshall and drummer Jerry Grinelli. Bassist Monty Ludwig and drummer Colin Bailey played on Linus and Lucy and Greensleeves. Vince Garaldi would compose for 15 Peanuts specials in total, the last one being 1976's It's Arbor Day, Charlie Brown. They were kind of running out of holidays. <laughs> and just a side note, that's Vince himself singing the song Little Birdie on a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Garaldi's relationship with fantasy began to sour uh -oh. as he was receiving only 5% of every record sale, while Fantasy was getting the other 95. What the hell? One for you, 19 for me? Yep. Ugh. You know, f later on, Fantasy would also royally put the screws to Creedence Clearwater Revival, but that's another story for another day. Mm, another episode. Mm. Vince would go on to record only three more albums for Warner Brothers. After he did the soundtrack for 1969's movie, A Boy Named Charlie Brown, Vince Garaldi ceased releasing new material. He would just work on the peanut specials. Mm -hmm. After 1971's Play It Again, Charlie Brown, Vince switched from regular piano to electric. Oh. The peanut specials allowed him to live a pretty comfortable life. He'd get office to go on tour and do other things, but he loved being in San Francisco, playing local clubs, and hanging out. Huh. A small life. Nothing Vin wrong with it. <clears throat> Vince Garaldi died on February 6, 1976, after playing what was supposed to be a first set at Butterfield's nightclub in Menlo Park, California. He went back to the room in which he was staying and had a massive heart attack. At Vince's mother's insistence, his peanuts music was played at the funeral. 
not a dry eye in the house. Oh. Now, as for the album, most of A Charlie Brown Christmas was recorded in the fall of 1965 in three sessions over a period of two weeks. Lee Mendelssohn wrote the lyrics to Christmas Time is Here on the back of an envelope in about 15 minutes. Wow, that's impressive. A kids' choir from St. Paul's Episcopal Church in San Rafael was used for Christmas Time is Here, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and My Little Drum. Mm -hmm. The choir director wanted perfection, but Mendelssohn and Garaldi wanted the kids to sound like, like kids. kids. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, not all the music featured in the Charlie Brown Christmas, the TV special, is on the soundtrack. Most notably, the song known as Air Music, also known as Surf and Snoopy. This is the music played while Snoopy decorates his doghouse oh, yeah. for the Lights and Display Contest. Lights and Display Contest? Oh, no. Yep. Why isn't it on there? I don't know. Hmm. Also, there are two songs that are on the soundtrack that are not in the special. Correct. What Child Is This? And the Christmas Song. In 2007, the Charlie Brown Christmas the album was voted into the Grammy Hall of Fame and added to the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry in 2012. It makes the Billboard Christmas albums chart every year, mm -hmm. and in 2021, it became the first jazz soundtrack to make the top 10 of the Billboard 200 albums chart. Mm -hmm. In 2022, it was certified quintuple platinum, 5 million copies sold. Get this, making it the number two best-selling jazz album ever right behind Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, as for me, I've been a huge Peanuts fan since I Birth. was a little kid. Yeah, yeah pretty Birth. much. I've seen all the specials, even the bad ones. Yes, it's Flash Beagle, Charlie Brown, I'm looking at you. Oh, is that the Flashdance craze? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> and I also have volumes of the strips in book collections. And I also have a Charlie Brown Christmas on vinyl. I got it back in the early 80s. And then I got it in CD in 1986. Now, it's been remastered at least three more times. But a lot of reviews on Amazon say to stick with the original 1986 release. Mm -hmm. it, uh, allegedly, it sounds the best out of all of them. Because I guess with the tapes, you can only do so much. Makes sense. Let us jump into the album itself. Oh, yes, let's. First track, Oh, Tin and Bomb. Oh, Tin and Bomb. I'll be honest, Oh Christmas Tree was never my favorite. I don't really remember the lyrics other than the title. And while Christmas trees are lovely, the so to them never really grabbed me. But I love what Vince Guaraldi does, starting out with the traditional arrangement and then doing a jazz arrangement, improvising with the drums and bass. And listening to this, it sounds like the background music of the most swanky holiday party in New York City, where everyone's having cocktails and wearing gowns and tuxedos. And I had the moment where I thought to myself, he came up with this arrangement for a cartoon? It's like when I think about all the music Shirley Walker wrote for Batman and Superman. Like the fact that she did like that Latin choir for Mask of the Phantasm. You listen to that and you go, holy shit. And this arrangement of O Tannenbaum is five minutes, but it doesn't feel too long. Although you do catch yourself wondering how he could keep improvising with the melody being pretty simple. And the notes of Jingle Bells fading away are a nice touch. I think, um... It might be something lost in translation because O Tannenbaum, it's a German Christmas song. Yeah. And it could be just something lost in translation because we get, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches? I'm sure the German one is not that. <laughs> yeah, it probably is not. Mm. Anyway, for the first 30 seconds, like you said, it's it sounds how you would expect O Tannenbaum to sound. And then it just mellows out into jazz. And Vince has a long solo but eventually comes back to the familiar song. Mm -hmm. And this song sets the stage for the rest of the album. It's not in your face. No. Which is pretty nice. This song is used in a few scenes. First when Charlie Brown and Linus go looking for a tree. Linus raps on an aluminum one and says, this really brings Christmas close to a person. And just like that, aluminum Christmas tree sales plummeted. Mm -hmm. Two years later in 1967, they were no longer manufactured. Mm -hmm. The song also plays after Charlie Brown kills the tree, or so he thinks, mm -hmm. and the rest of the Peanuts gang brings it back to life using the decorations from Snoopy's doghouse, in which he won first prize. Mm -hmm. Next track. What Child Is This? Not mine. Not mine either. Thank God. I had to sing What Child Is This uh, at the State House with my high school choir twice. It is very formal because it's supposed to convey the quiet majesty of a baby Jesus being born. With this jazz arrangement, it's more like, oh, this baby's so cute, can I bounce him? 
which I never thought I'd be describing this song as fun, but Vince Guaraldi makes it fun with his arrangement. And you do feel as if you're hearing these songs for the first time, which is why I love good jazz improv and how it can take songs to new places. But he isn't showing off. He's just creating a new kind of sound and vibing along with it, which I really appreciate. Yeah, that's true. That's one thing. He does not show off in the album. He even considered himself not that great a pianist. Yeah, as Charles Cornell saying, he's very much playing within his own abilities. And he says, you know, that sounds like an insult, but it's really not because he's aware of his instrument and knows how to use it. To quote Dirty Harry, man's got to know his own limitations. You have the good voice for Dirty Harry right now with your cold. Thank you. <gasps> Um, this track was not used in the show, and again, it's more mellowness, and, and I didn't look at it as like, I want to bounce the baby Jesus on my knee. <laughs> I thought it was more uh, contemplative. Contemplative? That too. Yeah. yeah whichever, whichever tomato, tomato. pronunciation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just like, okay, you know, we had the introduction of Christmas tree. Now we're just going to dial it back just a little bit, just to calm you down mm -hmm. a little more. Mm -hmm. But that's an interesting take that you have. Thanks. Next track, My Little Drum. The kid's making the percussive sounds of a drum roll. As long as they do. With their voice and tongue is really cool and pretty impressive that they managed to you know, stay <clears throat> consistent the whole time. We covered the chorale version of The Little Drummer Boy on the show when our first Christmas special, and it's not my favorite, Little Drummer Boy, I'm sorry. But similar to What Child Is This, Vince really brings the fun out, as if he's the one who got to play for the baby Jesus, and with no fear just started jamming because he only sees a baby who wants to have fun, like, Hey kid, you like music? Well, you like this? And even with the fun of the backup singers and the drum brushes, Vince still gets to shine with his subtle piano playing that again makes for a sophisticated cover that I will definitely add to my Christmas playlist. You know a song is good when I stop writing along to it and I just want to listen and not talk about it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a jazzy take on the little drummer boy, but Vince Guaraldi gets the songwriting credit instead of Harry Simone, Henry Onorati, and Catherine Davis. I think, well, maybe he changed it just, just enough. enough. Yeah. There's a certain, when well, we talked about this in one of our previous episodes, when we talked about how the Adams Family musical, they only got the rights to um, the... Uh, they, they didn't get the rights to the title song from the show until, like, the very last minute. And uh, they were saying, it's like, what is the Adams Family theme? Four notes? Do, 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 do. Do, do. Yeah, there were de there's a debate about how many notes it takes before you can be accused of plagiarism. Interesting. Yeah, so I don't know if maybe there was a certain number of notes here and it couldn't be considered plagiarism, or if it was jazzy enough that it couldn't be considered plagiarism. I don't know. Well, no lawsuits were brought. So, um, maybe until this podcast gets out there. Oh, Anyways, God, we're sorry. Then don't listen to it then. This is also not in the show. And like we said before, the kids, pop, pop, pum, pum, I can't do it. Pum, 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 pum. Thank you. you. They're, they're very impressive. And then there's that part where they break into that almost soaring, ooh. Yeah. It's like, it just kind of like takes off. Yep. And we're riding our sleigh over the snow, and Whee! it's peaceful. Or since we're in the desert, we're riding our uh, do sand buggy over the sandy hills of uh, Jerusalem. Okay, I could go for that. Yeah. And again, it's just, it's just, none of it is like in your face. No. It's just not. Maybe that's why they don't like the remastered one, because it mm. makes it in your face. Well, I know sometimes we remaster people, some people who do remastering think, if it sounds louder, it sounds better, no. and it can also sound shrill. Yeah, that's you true. Need, there are some people who can remaster stuff, and it's just so well done, and you feel like you're in the studio while it's being recorded because they mm -hmm. just have like this great air, and they get out a perfect balance of like the bass and the treble, and it's just amazing. Next track, Linus and Lucy. I always wondered why the Peanuts theme song was named after two side characters and not after Charlie Brown. This is the least Christmassy song on here, but that's because this piece was written for the documentary that never made it to air. Luckily, it was reused and is now a classic. I read this great comment on YouTube where this person took intro to jazz or jazz appreciation as a gen ed requirement, and the professor asked the students how many of them listened to and liked jazz music. A few hands went up, and he informed them, most people listen to jazz when they're young and have grown up with it all their lives. They just don't know it. And those students are like, what are you talking about? And he goes, does this sound familiar? And they sits down at the piano, and he played Linus and Lucy, and everyone smiled and laughed, and they realized, oh, yeah, we have grown up with this. 
But listening to this now, you can really hear the repartee between Linus and Lucy. Linus being the free spirit of the bridge and Lucy being grounded with the melody. It's like, listen, I'm just going to say it now. Lucy's the worst. She's an absolute bitch. And to quote Jeremy Johns, she's the kind of kid who you wouldn't mind seeing on the back of a milk cart and marked as missing. Anyway, I will say, though, my favorite version of, of this song is the arrangement written for It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Where Vince Guaraldi added a flute solo to sound like a fall breeze. And I associate Linus and Lucy more with Halloween than Christmas because of that. Still, it's always fun to listen to. Even if as a kid I hated the bridges and I wanted them to get back to the melody, it's like, I don't know this part, get back to the part I do know. As for Los Straight Jackets, their cover really syncs up with the animation very well, particularly when Schroeder puts on his I'm a serious pianist face. And the guitar playing of the bridge makes it a lot more fun and less honky-tonk. Mm -hmm. Okay, the most famous piece of Peanuts music ever, and it's not even named after Charlie Brown. Just his luck, huh? To quote Charlie Brown, good grief. He <laughs> couldn't even get a break in the music world. Mm. Like you said, this was originally written for the Charles Schultz documentary that no one wanted. When Vince Guaraldi came up with it, he called Lee Mendelssohn on the phone and told him, I have to play this for you now. And Lee Mendelssohn is saying, Nod, wait till we get in the studio. No, I have to play this for you now. I have to get it out of my head. Because the other, if I don't, then I'm, I'm going to forget explode. it. Yep. And when Lee Mendelssohn heard it, he just knew. Mm -hmm. He just knew this was it. Mm -hmm. And I read a comment from a piano player who said he, he plays this around Christmas and that people come up to him and, and ask if he can please play Charlie Brown. He tells them, it's called Linus and Lucy. They tell him, shut up and play it. <laughs> And like you said, this song has nothing to do whatsoever with Christmas, but then it does mm -hmm. because we're so used to hearing it at that time of year. I don't know. It's just, Great Pumpkin mm. was always my favorite. I preferred it to Charlie Brown Christmas growing up as a kid. So I always just preferred that version because it was associated with the special that I liked best. It's the flute that makes it Halloween-y. Yep. Okay. It's famously used in the scene with the kids dancing instead of working on the play. Mm -hmm. Schroeder on piano, obviously. Pigpen on bass, and Snoopy on guitar? He the, should be on drums. Yeah, who's playing the drums? It's I, the ghost. The theater's haunted. That's what it is. Well, maybe it's like Snoopy's just like really whacking the guitar. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, he should be on the drums, but then he can't groove like he does. Maybe the animators thought, yeah, we can get him more, you more know, fluid. lively yeah. instead of sitting behind a, a sitting drum behind set. A, that's the curse of us drummers. <laughs> anyway, as for the kids dancing... A lot of it looks easy to do because it's a cartoon, like with Shermie sticking his arms out in front of him and walking in one spot. Mm -hmm. But just try that in real life. Go ahead. Like on TikTok, they did the challenge. I think Lori Hernandez, was the gymnast, was the one who started it where they played Linus and Lucy's theme and the challenge was dance like a Peanuts character. And you see the physical exertion that you have to do to make it happen. Like, you know, the one guy who's like dancing with like shrugging his shoulders up and down. Yeah. I've tried doing that in real life. That's hard. That's really hard. It all is. Yep. yep. And like you mentioned, Low Straight Jackets do a rock and cover, and I got to see them do it as part of Nicolo's Christmas show back in 2019. Those guys, they just, ah, oh, they just bring it. They're great. Next track, which we're going to talk about twice. The first one, Christmas Time is Here, instrumental version. The thrumming at the base of the beginning was something that isn't in the vocal version, and I never noticed it before. I was like, wow, this is kind of nice. Now, the instrumental version of Christmas Time is Here sounds a lot sadder without the kids. It makes the nostalgia a lot more powerful. That's before I heard another version we're going to talk about, but we'll get there when we get there. Now, remembering when you were a kid and how exciting the holidays were because every day felt like Christmas, and then as you get older, it's on you to keep up the holiday spirits. It's not your daily surroundings as much with Christmas specials and Christmas songs and Christmas toys and Christmas commercials. And Christmas that and Christmas that and Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. Yep. So this track makes you reflect. And with the instrumental, Vince is able to do a lot more jazz improv, which is quite nice. But I have to say, without the kids singing it, it goes on a tad too long and you get kind of bored, unfortunately. Good party background music, though. Well, it is the longest song on the album here. Yeah, it's it's like a little over six, six minutes. minutes. But it makes sense because it's used a lot in the show as background music, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, the first scene after the opening credits, it segues into skating, which we'll get to a little bit later. And it shows up next when Charlie Brown goes to Lucy's psychiatrist booth when she tries to determine his fears. Mm -hmm. And that scene goes on for a while. And what did he have? Pantophobia? The fear of everything? Yes. Yep. That's it. 
Mm-hmm. And it also shows up next when Charlie, when um, Sally dictates her Christmas letter to Charlie Brown. All I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my fair share. Mm-hmm. But if, like, when we were watching the special and I was taking notes, it just really hit me. Wow, this is really used a lot. Mm-hmm. And, also, and Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, so I was going to make up the point of if you watch the show and you notice that Sally kind of takes a weird breath in between, it's because most of the kids that they hired for voice actors couldn't read. So they had to... It was the case of the person in the studio saying their lines and the kids repeating it back into the microphone. But it all works. Yeah, it does, because they sound like kids. <clears throat> yeah, they do. Um, yeah, this is a great song, and I think it's safe to say it's a holiday standard by now. Yeah. And guarantee that it will mellow you out. And, yeah, at first, when I, when I first listened to the album, I kind of thought the same as you. Like, yeah, this is kind of long, but over the years, I, I don't mind it. It just... It just calms me, calm, really calms me down. So now we know what Which, we have to play when you're driving. Tell Bob to do that, <laughs> that she'll let you drive the car. I got to drive last night. Hey, there you go. Okay, so this, uh, on the vinyl, this would be the end of side one. Hence, side two starts with... Christmas time is here, vocal version. We covered the original version before in, in our uh, past Christmas special, our first one, and that was a song that I picked, and I was frankly surprised that Dad didn't pick it for, uh, for his uh, song selection, but I picked it. And what I paid a lot more attention to this time were the voices of the children and how they sound like a really good elementary school choir. And you said that they had a different music director, but I was before I knew that, I was thinking, I wonder how Vince worked with the kids, because I thought that these were the same kids who were the voice actors for the Peanuts. So I was wondering if that was the case, how did he get them to sing his music when they couldn't read? Because that would have been interesting. Oh, yeah. Like, think about that. And it's like, most kids can't read music. I'm a singer and I can't read sheet music. Like, I can't sight read. But that would have been an interesting puzzle for them to solve. You can't read for sheet? Can't read for sheet. But he didn't stop them from sounding like kids. And he didn't dumb down the quality of his music to be simpler. What he did instead was he just adjusted the dynamics of the playing so the piano's a lot quieter and the kids' voices are more pronounced. Mm -hmm. It's wistful, even though you wonder, what do kids have to be wistful about? But it goes on for the appropriate length of time to leave the emotion hanging in the air. Now, as for Diana Krall, she cranks up the sad aspect of nostalgia to an 11. It's soldad. I am sad because I know I will never feel the happiness of this moment again. And I realized, oh, it's not bitter. It's literal seasonal depression. Hmm. She wants to feel that spirit and happiness and cheer and draw near to her family. But she doesn't have any joy to give. It's like hearing it for the first time, and I think Vince would have really liked the nuance she picked up on. And it reminded me of how, when I was in uh, doing Cinderella at Stadium Theater, Charlie Brown Christmas was in rehearsals, and one of the actors who played the knight, the lead knight, Dick High, was playing Charlie Brown. And when we would do our mic check, he would sing Christmas Time is Here while he did the Charlie Brown slump. And I realized, Charlie Brown singing this as a solo on the outside looking in at everyone else being happy is even more of a gut punch. And I think that's what they ended up doing. I think that's what Alex did with the number, who was our music director. So if you want happy, cheery bliss, listen to the vocal version, the vocal version alone. The other ones will make you have a blue Christmas. Wow. And I'm kind of glad that they, that they didn't do that for the special where it's like, let's have Charlie Brown sing this all by himself. This is used in the opening with the kids skating while Charlie Brown unloads on Linus about Christmas. Charlie Brown, you're the only person I know who could take a wonderful thing like Christmas and turn it into a problem. Maybe Lucy's right. Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're, you're the, the Charlie, Charlie Browniest. Brown yeah, we've seen this a few times. Yeah. And again, like I mentioned before, Lee Mendelssohn wrote the lyrics in 50 minutes on the back of an envelope like a regular Abe Lincoln. As you do. Yep. Uh, the words are simple. Listing things that happen during the season. Snowflakes in the air, carols everywhere. I always kind of thought it was very impressionistic. I never was bummed out about it, but now I think I will be. Um, <laughs> well, I'm only bummed out about it after I listened to Diana Krall, and I was like, these songs, it's not that they're two sides of the same coin, but it's kind of like a yin and yang going on. It's like the brighter the picture, the darker the negative, maybe. It's Elvis Costello's fault somehow. Fuck you, Elvis. Because he's married to her. <laughs> what? Oh, 
God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. We can't go one episode without Elvis Costello fucking ruining everything. <laughs> I hate you, Elvis. Well, okay, I don't hate you. I just hate the music minus one song. And I appreciate how you protested Margaret Thatcher, but that's about it. Other than that, I hate your guts. Anyway, okay, Dad, can, let me continue. Merry Christmas. Okay, Diana Krall does what I thought was kind of like a somnambulant version. Like, I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> or maybe it's like she's just so depressed she just wants to be unconscious. Or she's had a little too much of the sauce. Could be. Maybe she was going for sultry, but it just didn't come out that way. And I don't think you can do sultry with this song. I, th I just don't think it's possible. It just, it just reminded me of that scene in All About Eve where Betty Davis is sitting by the piano, drunk out of her mind, and having the pianist play that same sad piece over and over. That's the vibe I got from this. Uh huh. This, it, it's just not my favorite thing by her. Um, I'm just so used to the original version sung by the kids, and... I think they convey the innocence of the season that no adult can put across. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this made me curious, because uh, I was curious as to why you sent me this cover, because um, in our original Christmas special, I gave a full list of all the people who covered it. Let me see if I can find it. It's right here. One sec. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this has been covered by Debbie Boone. Mel Torme, Rosemary Clooney, R.E.M., Chicago, Kenny Loggins, Johnny Mathis, Diana Krall, and Sarah McLachlan. Huh. So I was wondering why you chose this one in particular, considering the myriad of artists that have covered it. Because I actually have it on CD. Oh, and as you said, we cover music that Dad has in his collection. Yep, it was, um, I think I still have it. It's a three, it's, it was a three-song CD, mm -hmm. an EP, and it came with a calendar. Oh, that's quite nice. Go figure. Next track. Skating. In the video essay by Charles Cornell, I sent Dad, uh, who's a jazz pianist on YouTube, he deconstructs all the music you know and love, he talked about how Vince's music for the special itself doesn't sound particularly Christmassy. Like, forget for a second that this was written for a Christmas special, which is kind of hard since that's what we associate with now, but when he broke it down you really listened to it, it sounds, you know, like sophisticated jazz music but without any sort of like Christmas chords or without any Christmas instruments like bells and pipe organs. But I think we can argue that skating sounds like winter. The piano solo sounds like snowflakes dancing on the ground and the slower movements sound like someone swiping their skates across the ice as they extend their legs. You can also hear spins and jumps. And that's when I realized this is his version of Montavani Skater's Waltz. You can really compare the two because they're good. You can't really compare the two because they're good in their own rights. But Montavani is more adult figure skater at the Olympics, and Vince is more, hey, let's go play outside. Look, Ma, watch what I can do. And I love it. Yep. Um, this is played during a conversation of when it's appropriate to eat snowflakes. Lucy but, waits until January. Yeah. And Linus says they need sugar, which I agree. They sure look right to me. Mm -hmm. um, then the kids try to knock a kin tan off a fence with snowballs. Linus wins by using his blanket as a slingshot and gets instant street cred. Except with Lucy, but then he puts in her place. You think you're so smart with that blanket. What are you going to do with it when you grow up? Maybe I'll turn it into a sport coat. And then you told me. <laughs> Snoopy got his hands on Linus's blanket and he turned it into two sport coats. One for him and one for Woodstock. And then Linus killed Snoopy and Woodstock in a bloody bath in the end. Yep. Since it's not used during the skating scene, I think I would have called it snowing. Or maybe, just, or maybe just snow, because snowing is like, snowing just sounds unpleasant. Or snow, snow day. Is like, oh, it's pretty. How about snow day? Snow day, I work with that. Yeah. Because, like you like you mentioned, his piano playing on this song has just always given me the impression of falling snowflakes. Do -do 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 oh, pretty. And then you gotta go shovel in. Yes, <laughs> yes. This is, this is perfect for, lis this is perfect listening for being inside the house watching the snow fall, and then it hits you like you said, oh crap, I gotta go out there and clear the driveway. You should get those Bluetooth earmuffs that I have and just play this song while, while you're shoveling snow on a loop. Maybe it'll make you feel better. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Moving know. to Florida would work better, or Arizona. Or Hawaii. Yeah, that would work too, Meli Kaliki Maka. Anyway. Allegedly. Next track, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark! Hockey stick! Hockey stick, but that's the other Christmas special. This is the famous scene where the kids fix up Charlie Brown's tree and start singing. And one thing I really appreciate is how the animators took time to animate the breath and the pause in between each vocalese because for such rough animation, that's pretty impressive. 
And this whole scene is pretty moving because you see how the spirit of the Christmas season inspired them to care about Charlie Brown for once in their life, as opposed to the whole year round, which would have been nice, but hey, it's Christmas. And what I love about the kids singing is that they sound like kids. They're not polished with editing magic. There's some kids struggling to hit the notes and there's some kids who hold the notes for a bit too long. But it sounds like, you know, as I said before, kids elementary school choir and it's realistic. And it's also moving to see Charlie Brown happy for once in his life. As Charles Schultz said, Charlie Brown is not used to being a winner, but this time he won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is sung at the end. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. Now get this. Originally, uh, with the original animation, originally Snoopy was singing along with the kids. Wow. Then someone came to their sense and, and realized, you know, when it comes down to it, he's a dog. Plus also when he speaks in the comics, it's a thought bubble. It's not yeah. a speech bubble. Yeah. So he was, re he was redrawn with a closed mouth, but he still has the gestures. If you watch, he's lifting his head up like the other kids and all that. But mm -hmm. his mouth, absolutely shut. He's just smiling. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I know earlier we talked about Lee Mendelson and Vince Guaraldi not wanting the kids to sound perfect when they sing, mm -hmm. but this sounds pretty mistake-free to me. Like you said, you picked up on a couple of subtleties that just, yeah. you know, go over my head. Mm -hmm. There's always that one sore thumb that sticks out in a choir. You want something not perfect yeah. in a Charlie Brown, in the Charlie Brown specials? Listen to the kids sing over the river and through the woods <laughs> on a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. Now that one is just not perfect to the point where it's annoying. <laughs> they're just having a race to see who can finish first. Yeah. But I can kind of see, you know, they're in the back of a station wagon getting jostled around because seat law, seatbelt laws were not a thing back then. This yeah. was the 70s. They just throw them in the back. They're just banging all over the place. No big deal. Yeah. As long as they don't fall out of the car like I did once. Anyway. Oh, yeah, that story, but that's for another time. Yeah, that's, that's definitely imperfect. Next track, Christmas is Coming. It is? Uh, yeah, it's uh, going to be here in about a week. <laughs> Christmas is Coming. Anyway, I never knew that this was the title of the song that plays when the kids are dancing on stage, but the more you know. One thing Vince Guaraldi is great at establishing is movement. His pieces have a certain pace and stay there. And this piece reminds me of the hubbub and chaos of the Christmas season mm. with occasional pauses to rest and soak up time to be with family. But or, again, or have a drink at the bar. <laughs> there's this undercurrent of fun. As you remember, it'll all be worth it once the actual day comes. Yet it's strange. This one isn't as memorable the whole way through as its opening notes. But that's most likely because the opening notes are all we hear in the Christmas special. And this track isn't one that gets a lot of airplay on the radio. If it was played more, maybe I'd feel different. But this one, I only really got excited when that specific section from the cartoon started playing. Yeah. Yeah, this is played a little bit when the kids are dancing instead of rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And why not? You hear it, you want to dance. Yeah. Uh, to me, this is the liveliest song on here, and that even includes Linus and Lucy. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. And it's, it's so funny, like with some of these titles, I have to think, wait a minute, which song is this? Because I'm not, I'm, I've never really been used to putting the titles to the songs until we actually did this podcast. Yep. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a song when they play during this part. Oh, yeah, that's a song during this part. Which, to be fair, I don't think most people would recognize these titles until they heard them. Yeah, and then, mm. you know, smack on forehead. I've heard that oh, a million duh, times. That one, yeah. Yeah. Next track, For Elise. Not fur? Not Fur. Fur? For. For? Yes. Fur? This is the English translation of the title. Oh, I went with the German. Schroeder would love this because it's Beethoven Christmas music. And what we hear on the album is a full version of what he plays in the special. Just the piano and something about the sound quality makes you picture Vince playing this in the studio alone. And from the way he plays it, you can tell he has great respect for classical composers. It is Beethoven, and he plays it straight. And he only plays the part of that piece that everyone knows, which is only a little over a minute. Straightforward and well done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of Christmas music is that? Beethoven Christmas music. Also better known as, or uh, not better known as, Bagatelle Number 25. Beethoven wrote it in April 1810. It was published in 1867, 40 years after Beethoven's death. Wow. Now, there are three possibilities as to whom Elise is. Number one, Teresa Malfatti, a friend and student of Beethoven's. But she's also looked on as the one who got away. Oh. Allegedly, the title was incorrectly transcribed. It should have been for Therese. Oh. Number two. Elizabeth Rocco, nickname Elise, and she was a German soprano singer. Mm. Suspect number three, Elise Barensfeld, 
a child prodigy who would go on to receive singing lessons from Antonio Salieri. Uh oh. Oh yeah, and then she was dead. <laughs> also, there's a theory that Therese Malfatti asked Beethoven to dedicate the piece to Elise as a favor. Oh, which which one is the theory that most classical historians accept? Did they say? Um, the first one, Therese. Oh, okay. But people have their theories. Okay. Um. And the thing was, I did a lot of searching, maybe not enough, but I could not find any connection with the song and Christmas. No, I don't see it. Maybe they just wanted him to play Beethoven because that's his favorite musician, Schroeder. But it is considered an example of the Romantic music movement from the 18th and 19th centuries. And then right after, well, while Schroeder's playing it, Lucy interrupts him with, by the way, do you know Jingle Bells? And he plays the ornate piano version, mm -hmm. then the organ version, and then the toy piano version. The only time it sounds like a toy piano on his piano. Which apparently is the version that she loves. Mm -hmm. Final track, Christmas Song. If you had told me this was the Christmas Song by Mel Torme, I wouldn't have recognized it at first. But then eventually you hear the melody and you're like, oh, that's what this is. And it's one of the few songs on the album that sounds Christmassy because the only songs that are, are covers. But I have to say for an instrumental, it's very beautiful. I'm not sure why it's on here, Maybe Vince felt like playing it, and they said, sure, go ahead, because it's never played in the special. I think if they had ended it at full release, it would have been an interesting choice. Maybe you could have also swapped this out for a Snoopy song and just redone the order a little bit. But it's here, and for an instrumental, it's fine, with the most interesting part being a slight reprise of Christmas time is here at the end. As for Christina Aguilera, holy shit, those candles are a fire hazard in that music studio. Now, listen, the sound quality is fine. And yet, I am not a fan of her riffing all over the place in every single song she does. I love riffing when it's an expression of joy and happiness, or if you use it to show off, do it occasionally, but get back to the friggin' melody. And at one point she sounded like she was gargling water. Yet, we all know there's one version everyone thinks of, and it's not the two of these. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's a reason that they sent you that one. Okay. We'll fi you'll find out in a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not in the show, but I think ending the album on for release just would not have worked. Plus, there's also the possibility of, you know, scenes that, okay, we decide not to use this, even though, you know, you played this music for it. You oh, know, yeah, we'll put gonna... it on the album. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And Vince Guaraldi plays it as a solo piece for about a minute and a half. Then the rest of the trio joins in and Vince really solos. But again... It's so calm, and I think it's also a nice way to go out. Mm -hmm. Now, the song itself was written in July 1945 by Robert Wells and Mel Torme. It was an effort to say, stay cool on a hot day in July. Mm -hmm. They just started writing down things like Jack Frost nipping, Yuletide carols, and so on. They wrote it in 45 minutes. Wow. Nat King Cole recorded the song four different times from 1946 to 1961. Which is the one that we hear the most? The 1961 version is the one mm -hmm. you more than likely hear these days. Now, according to BMI, it is the most performed Christmas song. Loads of covers. I've now, done it at voice recitals. Now, stupefyingly, uh -huh. Christina Aguilera's version in 1999 made it all the way to number 18 on Billboard's Hot 100 Singles Chart. You're kidding. The second highest chart position for the song <gasps> after the original. Wow. Now, to me, now correct me if I'm wrong using this term, but I, I wasn't sure. Okay. She does her annoying Christina Melisma vocal antics a few times. But uh -huh. not enough to totally ruin the song until the end. Mm -hmm. Then she cuts loose and we're left with a big steaming pile of reindeer poop. <laughs> Just hit the damn note and move on. Thank you. God. And I guess, and, okay, so that Chris, that Charles, Chris Cornell, that Charles Cornell video that you had me watch, he said it's not really a Christmas album. Mm -hmm. For the most part. Yeah. I mean, there are some Christmas songs on here, like you said, they're covers, but the rest really are not. But the thing is, like, from watching <clears throat> the special, Brown. yeah. Let's let's say I was, like, seven or eight years old yeah. when i could like retain this yeah, sure so that would be uh 1971. right so i've listened to the, watch this special 51 times yeah so i cannot help associating 
the non-Christmas songs with Christmas. They're just always going to have that thing. Yeah. And I think the only one that escapes it, like you said, is Linus and Lucy because it's the most famous song and it shows up in almost every special that yes. they've done. Yeah. I it, mean, like even in the Thanksgiving one, they play it at while they're all making the, the toast and the jelly beans and the pretzels and all that, the mm -hmm. big meal. Alright, overall, I'm glad we finally covered this album. I remember Dad was pretty worried because he wasn't sure how we were going to cover a bunch of instrumentals, but I like to think we did a good job. It's interesting... I'm sure you'll let us know, listeners. Oh, yes. It's interesting how Charles Cornell pointed out that, again, that um, Vince isn't considered one of the jazz greats, but he brought his jazz music into the pop culture in a way that's been beloved by generations. He should be counted as one of the greats, in my opinion. And Can he be counted as one of the jazz goods? That's fair to say. Oh, jazz very goods? Very goods. And I would like to say that I hope the Peanuts come back on public TV so kids can continue to grow up with this special because it's on Apple now. And if they don't, do yourself a favor. Buy a DVD player and buy the box set of the Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas Peanuts specials. It's well worth it. Because you can watch them anytime you want. Lastly, Vince was one of the artists taken before his time, and I wish he lived long enough to see the effect his music had years later. Thank you, Vince. And... If you find the Christmas season stressful, and hey, who doesn't? This is the perfect antidote. Mm -hmm. Put it on in your home and just sit on a chair or the couch. Just sit back. Take it easy. This will calm you down. Mm -hmm. Highly, highly, highly recommended. Then after it's done, go start stressing out again. All right, as always, thank you for listening to... Our final installment of 2022 of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz, because the more you interact with the video, the higher chance our video has of being seen on YouTube. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, then uh, just shoot him an email and he'll send you the episode right to your inbox. As always, thank you for listening to My Dad Listens to This. To all our listeners who've joined us in the U.S., in the United Kingdom, and in Canada, we thank you for listening. We can't wait to be back with season five next year. We've been doing this for five years, Dad. It doesn't seem like it, though. No, but what we can tell you is that our first episode of 2023 will have the number five involved somehow. You'll just have to wait until January to find out. So, Dad, is for, for one last time in 2022, is there one thing you want to say to our loyal listeners before we sign off? I just don't know, Linus. I just don't know.